Hi everybody, Dr. Daniel, and today I'm talking about concussion and migraine. Well, I started out as a neurology resident at the Mayo Clinic in 1971, and at that time, <clears throat> the word concussion, as it explained to me, was head injury associated with a brief loss of consciousness. And we're talking there about three to four minutes, and uh, the patient then would come back and be okay. If it was longer than that, we'd worry about things like cerebral contusion, which means a bruise of the brain, or even bleeding in the head, which could cause an epidural or a subdural hematoma. At that time, in 71, the only workup you could do would be a history and an neurologic exam, and we'd do a skull x-ray, maybe an EEG, but it really wouldn't help that much unless there was a fracture of the skull that you could see on the x-ray. But in the early 70s, the Mayo Clinic developed the first CAT scanner, They're the first one in the United States, and then that technology spread across America so that <clears throat> nowadays in ERs, somebody has a head injury is going to get a CAT scan done pretty quickly. If later they do an MRI scan, that can show uh, a more precise anatomy of the brain, and you can see micro bleeds in there that you couldn't see on CT, and you can see linear stress injuries of the brain you couldn't see on CT. But CAT scan is really good for seeing blood, and that's what the ER doctor really wants to know if the patient has blood in the head. Migraine is a genetically and familial inherited medical problem that causes the release of neurochemicals in the brain. And these neurochemicals inflame the general nerve, the arteries, and the thalamus. And that's part of the problem. And with shakeup of the head or trauma of the head, such happens with a concussion, these neurochemicals are released. And that's probably the reason that persons with migraine get more worse headache with a concussion than a so-called normal person without migraine. So the migraine brain is a very sensitive brain. It's sensitive to falling estrogen, to lack of sleep, to uh, certain flashing lights. It's sensitive to stress. It's sensitive to uh, not eating well. So a concussion in someone with migraine gives a much worse clinical problem because of the special, special condition of the migraine brain. Um, Currently, mild concussion, concussion would be someone who has a head injury with headache and pain and trouble lasting seven to 10 days. And if you have symptoms past that, that's called post-concussion syndrome, which is sort of poorly defined, firm, infirm gray borders as a condition. Some people think it lasts three months, six months, up to a year. Uh, my problem there as a neurologist and a headache doctor has been you have to really watch for the development of medication over use headache from treating the original head injury uh, with any kind of medication or painkillers that can aggravate <clears throat> the brain and cause uh, long-term headaches. So if you take too much caffeine, triptans, over-the-counter drugs, Tylenol, Advil, NSAIDs, or certainly opiate narcotics or butalbital, those are the main drugs that can cause medication over use headache, then just keep a headache going on forever. And so I'm very critical of the literature when I see things like <clears throat> persons who have uh, war injuries with head injury that had X lasting a year. Because if you read the article, you won't see anything about the physician looking at how much headache medicine they're taking. And this, these can clearly keep the headache going on for a long period of time. So it's a difficult area. Now, the word concussion now uh, comes from the French, I'm sorry, from the Latin word, uh, Contour, which means to shake, and con means with. So it's with to shake the head. And that certainly happens with uh, head injuries with concussion. Also, these vague terms of head injury with concussion have been attached to it, such as a light concussion, a mild concussion, a concussion without loss of consciousness, or severe concussion, and things like that. We all know about the football player who gets hit on the head and may hit the ground with his helmet and he gets up and is able to play it. He'll throw passes and do pretty well, but he comes off the sideline and talks to the trainer. He doesn't know where he is or the date or what team he's playing. And so he's had like a blackout uh, sort of thing or they uh, gave him a head injury he's really not aware of. And he needs to sit out a period of time and be checked over medically to be sure he's okay. Another thing we worry about is the second impact syndrome. So if someone 
returns to sports world and is exercising gets another headache for a critical period of time, they can have development of cerebral uh, edema, which causes brainstem herniation and really even death. So that's led to this uh, great development of interest in sports like, like football, which is a traumatic event that causes many head injuries and concussions and limiting players' time to go back to, to the field and that kind of thing. So this has been um, also added to by the development of the, our knowledge of what's called the uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, which is abbreviated. And that's an illness that has its own clinical history with uh, neurologic symptoms and psychiatric symptoms of moodiness and depression, trouble sleeping, and also has its own pathology and neuroradiology. So we want to prevent that sort of development in persons who've had mild concussion by not sending them back on the field too soon. So I read this uh, comment about concussion definition. In lay terms, concussion can mean, it's the long list of words, I think it's sort of humorous and interesting as well. It can mean a bump, a collision, a crash, an impact, an impingement, a jar, a jolt, a jounce, a kick, a shock, a slam, a smash, a strike, or a wallop. And the brain itself is precious tissue that kind of has a consistency of gelatin. And it also has different little folders it's encased in, kind of like pieces of chocolate from Whitman's chocolate have little compartments where it's involved. So there, there are dura-lined compartments for the frontal, the middle, the parietal, and occipital lobes in the brain where the brain sits in these areas. Another interesting thing is what is the pathology of a concussion? Well, we really don't know because most of these folks never come in um, to death and their brain is not analyzed. We don't know the micro scopic structure or what goes on in the brain. It's only, it's only surmised. I remember here in the past that they had um, a car wreck next to an EEG lab and they quickly had moved someone who had a concussion in the lab and wired them all up and their, um, their EEG was slow during that time and then became more normal. So structural things uh, as tests, skull x-ray, MRI scan, CT scan should be normal with concussion but something that measures the physiology of the brain, like EEG, would be altered and show slowing differently. The other thing we look for is the development of amnesia. Amnesia means lack of memory. And you can sort of judge the amount of retrograde amnesia uh, and correlate that with the severity of a head injury or concussion. Retrograde means amnesia loss before the event. So if someone can remember in a car wreck, everything else at the moment of impact, they really don't have any retrograde amnesia. But if they have the same car wreck and they can't remember, you know, the week before that, then they have a week or seven days of retrograde amnesia. And persons with retrograde amnesia are thought to have more severe head injuries than persons who don't have that. Okay, what are the neurologic symptoms following a concussion? I'm just gonna read those. You get a headache or feel good pressure in the head. There may be temporary loss of consciousness with the event. The, the patient may feel like confused, like they're in a fog. They have amnesia regarding the event, as I just mentioned. They may have dizziness or they may be seeing stars. They have ringing in the ears, nausea, vomiting, slurred speech, delayed response to questions. They appear dazed and fatigued. They may have this post-concussion vertigo or spinning. They may have an epileptic seizure at the time of the, the concussion. Well, what is the incidence of concussion? One study from Columbia University in 12, uh, found with 1,203 athletes found that 23% of women and 17% of men had at least one concussion during their college days. The American Medical Society for Sports Medicine has estimated that 1 to 1.8 million sports-related concussions occur per year in patients younger than 18 years old. That's a big deal. This organization defined concussion as a, quote, traumatically induced transient disturbance of brain function, end quote. American County Neurology states that each year 1.63 uh, to 8 million concussions result from sports recreation injuries in the United States. 
and almost 9% of U.S. high school sports injuries revolve concussions. All right, so what are the risk factors for development of concussion? Well, activities and factors that increase the risk include falling, especially in young children and in older folks trying to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, participating in high-risk sports such as football, hockey, rugby, boxing, other contact sports. Those are the highest incidence sports, but it can occur in any sports. It's more common in high-speed contact sports. And football, rugby, and hockey, and soccer have the greatest risk, whereas baseball, volleyball, and gymnastics have some risk, but it's not as great. So the other things that are risk for this, of course, everybody knows, being involved in a motor vehicle accident, being involved in a pedestrian or bicycle accident, being a soldier involved in contact and combat, being a victim of physical abuse, having a previous concussion, uh, it leads to increased problems later, having migraine, as we mentioned earlier, and also having the APOE gene, which is associated with dementia, but also with brain problems. Now, what's the advice regarding return to activity after concussion? The American Medical Society consensus guidelines endorse 24 to 48 hours of symptom-limited cognitive physical rest followed by a gradual increase of activity. So persons uh, should return to sports activity after they successfully return back to work or return back to school. And the pa patient should never return to play or vigorous activity while they're still having symptoms of a concussion. And the statement there is, if in doubt, sit it out. So the other thing I watch for in my own practice is what I call patients who've had no really history of migraine, they'll tell you, and they have a head injury, and they may overtreat and they get these horrible rebound of medication over these headaches. And they may have had what I call latent migraine. Latent migraine are folks who may have a family history of someone with migraine, like a mother with migraine or a sister. It may be somebody who's had sinus headaches, which are really migraine, or menstrual headaches, many of which are migraine or headaches from fasting or, or oversleeping. Those are migraine kind of possible symptoms that patients may develop head injuries like migraine, but they've never had severe, fully developed migraine before that event. So these are my thoughts on the relationship between concussion and migraine. God bless all you folks who've had migraine or head injury. Uh, please subscribe down there and follow me on YouTube for other talks I have on headache. And I'll see you again on the next talk.